Good afternoon, everyone. We'll just, I see a lot of individuals joining. Thank you so much for joining us today. A few of us, I see we're still connecting to audio. Wonderful. Well, good afternoon to each and every one of you. Let's get started. It's about 2.02. Um, and just thank you for being here with us today during our first Juniper Statewide Summit. Um, it's, it's in a different um, platform than maybe what we've usually been in, engaging with Juniper in the, in the past. We're all virtually, um, but it's so great to see every one of you. My name is Sarah Blanigan and I am the Juniper Network Director. Uh, and I just want to share with you that, you know, Juniper is a statewide of, uh, a statewide network of community organizations. And today we have in the audience, those community organizations that offer evidence-based health promotion classes, which help adults in Minnesota take charge of their health and well-being. And we're just very pleased to be able to welcome all of you that have been part of the Juniper Network for some time now, and those that are newer to the community, we are proud to be able to host this first wide Juniper Statewide Summit today, again, in, that, in this virtual space. This is on Zoom um, with all of you being here. It's, it's going to be interesting because in this virtual space, I do have, you know, we're, we're all set up differently in a virtual space. So I have two screens here. So excuse me for, you know, maybe not always looking at, at you over here, <laughs> but my camera's here. Um, and our audience does include, like I mentioned uh, about, you know, we invited about 140 or more of those Juniper provider organizations in our communities. And these organizations have roots in the communities and they're well trusted amongst their community members to offer health promotion and those false prevention um, programs. We also have class leaders, community organizations that also promote Juniper class opportunities to their community members who may not be providing that service. We also have in our audience healthcare system representatives, healthcare payers and individuals from local and state government agencies. So these individuals really um, make this Juniper um, network of community-based organizations, community-based organizations work and, and sustain. So before I get started, I would like to, you know, again, express my appreciation to, to those individuals joining us today and those who have helped make this two-day event come together to be successful. So I'd like to um, call out specific names and acknowledge specific individuals. So Julie Rolls, our Vice President of Engagement with Juniper or Innovations for Aging. David Stibbe, the Juniper Provider Relationship and Experience Manager. Rachel Hummel our Juniper Contract and Compliance Specialist, all of the Juniper Provider Relationship Managers, and Lindsay Bankhead, our Juniper Business Analyst, who's um, been providing a lot of our information for today's uh, summit, and especially the Pollen Midwest um, team, uh, who's allowing us to feel uh, less anxious in this virtual space. So um, thanking Julie Cohen, Tom Loftus, um, Monica Nadal, uh, Nadal, and the best thing is that Monica has uh, a cat, and the cat's name is Juniper. Um, so I just think it, um, it's really great to be able to partner with all of you in this space. I just want to go over some housekeeping items um, in this virtual space. There are some features that you can see in on your screen. On the lower bar on your screen, you can see a microphone. Um, you'll likely see that it's muted right now. You have an option about for video as the next item. Then you can see um, a security emblem. Going past that, you can see participants and chat and other options. I want to highlight the chat function. So um, we will have one of our Juniper Provider Relationship Managers, Sarah Shepard, manage and monitor that throughout this um, um, summit and she'll manage the comments and questions that come in so she can help guide the the questions that come in so we can answer them. We will also have um, some question and answer sessions after two of our presenters today. 
The first one, Don Simonson is going to present and then we'll have a question and answer session there. And then the second is, is with our keynote, uh, Timothy McNeil, and we'll have a question and answer session after that one. So for the question and answer sessions, you have the option to chat, but you also have the option to raise your hand, not physically, um, but you'll, all, you'll be able to do it through um, the participant. If you click on participants, the, the feature there, a window will pop up or come to the side of your screen. And in the lower right-hand corner, you will have the option of raising your hand virtually. Um, if that isn't working for you, please do um, chat the question too. We want to be able to have you voice a question if you're comfortable doing that. So after you raise your hand, we will be able to unmute uh, you so you can ask your question um, with your voice. Further, um, there, are some, there, are, there are some features that you can do in uh, selecting your name that is present. So right now mine says Sarah Blonde again. And if I hover over the three dots, I can choose with my left hand cursor, I can rename myself and I can change it to Sarah Blonde again. And as a Juniper Network Director, I'll just put Juniper with my organization. You can do that by again, choosing the three dots over your image, or you can click on participants, find yourself on that participant list, choosing more and then renaming yourself. Um, knowing that this is a virtual space, um, you can choose to keep your video on so we can see your faces and your reactions. And maybe um, one, of my, well, one of my team members likes to say, um, emotional outbursts visually, right? Um, about some really exciting information that we're sharing. Um, or you can stay um, by, not, by not sharing your video, whatever you prefer. It is great to see your faces though. Um, we know that this is a two and a half hour meeting. So please do take care of yourself as needed. All right, so for uh, today, we are um, going to, um, have some amazing speakers. Again, like I mentioned, um, Don Simonson is going to speak and we'll have our keynote with Timothy McNeil. I know some individuals are, um, are joining us today specifically for that and he'll start at 3.30 Central Standard Time. So to get this, um, the summit kick off and um, get some energy in this virtual space, I'd like to ask you a question if possible. You know, how many of you have, have felt an instance of uncertainty or, or failure when trying to protect your own health or the health of a loved one. Um, I ask that because the theme today is to try and alleviate that feeling. Um, and I know I felt this feeling recently actually when I visited a, my clinical provider and that I received after that visit a, a printed off summary visit saying, you know, we recommend that you do X, Y, and Z uh, to continue um, my to continue treatment plan. And I received that list and I said, okay, um, thanks for the visit. I'll, I'll see you later. And it was that I just, I, it was, I, I, I'll see you later. Um, and I didn't feel really well equipped and I, I felt like I was missing some guidance and I felt a little alone. Um, like I didn't have a team really surrounding me um, to help me navigate the changes I needed to make in my path to well-being. Um, and I think I understand this because there are some spaces that are a little um, piecemeal in our healthcare system. Um, so then I asked myself, and I, I now ask all of you, you know, why do we feel like this? Why do we feel some self doubt when it comes to our health and well and healthcare and well being um, and being able to navigate that? So, you know, this might be because of feelings of of we don't have the tools available for us. Um, we're missing a sense of self-empowerment or confidence, just managing that, the conversations. And maybe it's that our clinical care feels like a stranger sometimes and it feels separate from our individual paths of well-being um, that we experience every day in our communities. So I do encourage you to keep this, these questions and um, a top of mind throughout this two-day summit and listen to our presenters, our keynote speakers, and when you're participating in the breakout sessions, um, the, these questions and these feelings of how we can overcome these, um, 
these individual feelings because if if we're feeling it we know our community members are also feeling it so i sincerely hope that you will enjoy today and tomorrow during the summit um, keeping those questions in mind and how we can come together as a, a network throughout the state of minnesota um, as community-based organizations as collaborative partners to really improve the overall overall health and well-being of our um, our neighbors in minnesota well i am um, it's really fun to be able to introduce our next speaker. Um, it's Don Simonson, our, our president of Innovations for Aging. Um, it's going to be full of, ref the, re the conversation with Don is going to be full of reflection, discovery, and inspiration. So really excited to hear about the past, present, and future of Juniper. Um, we know this topic we'll, we'll all be able to relate to because it's, we've all played a role in the Juniper network. Um, and, and how this will impact our, our future activities to continue to um, help individuals in Minnesota feel confident throughout their paths of, of well-being and, and healthcare. So again, our first speaker is the Executive Director, Don Simonson of Metropolitan Area Agency on Aging and the President of Innovations for Aging, like I said. Um, Innovations for Aging is a wholly owned subsidiary of the, the Metropolitan Area Agency on Aging. And Don brings to us today an experience of more than 20 years in the field of aging, healthcare and advocacy. And she's nationally recognized for her leadership as an innovator and collaborator. And her priorities are to develop networks and other partnerships that support older adults to live healthy and secure lives at home. So please do help me in welcoming Don Simonson. Thanks so much, Sarah. I'm so glad to be with all of you today. And you know, as I've been thinking about preparing for today, I think my mind and maybe your minds are naturally focused on the, on the COVID-19 pandemic and on important and large issues of uh, race and politics present really in our everyday lives. But I would say, you know, it's okay to turn our attention to Juniper for a few hours um, because you'll come away feeling hopeful and activated. Juniper, as Sarah said, is about individual wellness and community health. And we're really, Juniper is well aligned to be part, maybe a small part, but part of a solution that addresses pressing societal issues. Now, Juniper, Juniper is about informed self-care and self-efficacy. And the network recognizes full well that people of color and others facing historic disparities have the greatest incidence of the chronic diseases that Juniper helps address. But keep in mind, the Juniper network of providers and its classes offer hope, empowerment, the support of others, and a future of wellness for all. So welcome. I think our time together here is, is important and the work we're doing together um, and work that others will, will join us to do together um, is part of making our world a better place. Now, as Sarah said, our health is one of the most personal components of our individual identities. And learning how to manage one's health, you know, really the how to manage one's health, not what to, just to change, is the key to long-term long -term positive outcomes. Now, Juniper's classes equip participants to make lifestyle changes, changes to their everyday behaviors at home, Juniper classes help participants make better decisions every day and better choices over the long term and to be more savvy consumers of healthcare. So in the example that Sarah gave you, um, someone who'd been a Juniper participant might reconnect back to that healthcare provider and say, I left your office confused. I really don't understand. I need some more help. That's what Juniper can do so that we don't feel so alone and we become better equipped in terms of consuming healthcare. Now, Juniper comes alongside traditional healthcare services, certainly doesn't replace and supplements medical care in the clinic or other setting. And today, um, healthcare is online, Juniper is also online. So we're all unique with unique needs. Juniper helps each of us understand our health conditions, identify strategies to manage them and feel confident, even if we take small steps that will make a big difference over time. Juniper's network providers 
uh, provide care that's holistic and fits our community members' needs for a positive health future where everyone can be the leader of their own healthy life. Now we have on the screen here a map and lots of busyness behind that map, right? Lots of connecting points and connections. And um, it, it looks a little bit frantic, doesn't it? But the reality is that, uh, that networks are, are an important uh, part of how we go about our daily lives, including our lives of health and our lives of wellness. Now the team at Innovations for Aging developed the Juniper concept in 2016 when the drivers at the time were really focused on a growing older population, right? The aging of the baby boom, unprecedented. We're right in the midst of that today. Another driver was that we were also recognizing that the cost of healthcare may become unsustainable for individuals and for public programs like Medicare. And there was growing interest among thought leaders in the social risks or social determinants of health that are most impactful to health outcomes. You might know we all began to see pie charts reflecting research that while medical care is critically important, the social and environmental factors um, impact our health, as does heredity. And so Minnesota's area agencies on aging knew that we had something to offer to address social and health risks, but we had a very tiny capacity. What, what we had going for us was experience in learning about and funding evidence-based disease prevention and health promotion programs under Title 3D of the Older Americans Act. And we could see their outcomes both um, locally, and we knew that the national literature was developing a body of evidence about um, these tested evidence-based programs that was tremendously exciting. And we knew we could develop a, pro a value proposition uh, with a little bit of help. And that value proposition is that evidence-based health promotion classes deliver results for individuals, right? People feel better. They get their lives back. They are able to maintain important relationships, develop new relationships, and get inspired sometimes to help others do the same, right? We know that Juniper class leaders um, often will encourage others to become class leaders. So evidence-based health programs, whether focused on managing diabetes or pain or reducing falls, have value. They lower the cost of health care, for example, by reducing emergency department visits and hospitalizations. And they can also be a part of transforming how communities think about health and health care. The lay leaders in Juniper communities are awesome and they catalyze wellness for their neighbors. What a tremendous uh, way to go about creating health for people. So we all know it's hard to get a new diagnosis, whether it's cancer, COPD, heart disease. We also know that chronic conditions tend to pile up, right, as we become older. People 65 plus usually have them in multiples. And this can lead and I'm gonna say us because I'm in that 60 plus category now, this can lead us to feeling helpless and maybe even hopeless, um, perhaps frustrated or sad. But evidence-based health promotion programs give older adults and others an opportunity to do more to gain control of their lives and improve their health on what's most important to them. Now, I'm likely preaching to the choir here because I know we have many uh, Juniper organizations in attendance, but it's worth calling out and raising up, especially now. I'm inspired and excited by what Juniper has accomplished so far, helping more than 20,000 people take charge of their health, engaging over 800 local leaders, and engaging more than 140 providers of evidence-based health promotion classes. So currently Juniper offers a robust menu of options to address the needs of people, communities, health systems, health plan payers, and other financial supporters, and more is on the way. So let's look at our next slide. Thanks, Julie. At its very core, Juniper started with a question. How can more people benefit from classes that promote health and wellness? Again, these, these um, classes that were available at small scale under the Federal Older Americans Act. So MAAA, which soon developed IFA, our nonprofit subsidiary, and our AAA partners in Minnesota, developed uh, Juniper. And, um, and really this question, 
was what helped us align our work. Now the stars aligned for us and a private foundation with specific interest in wellness of older adults, particularly in, in uh, greater Minnesota, interested in their independence and in their well-being, was seeking a larger scale project that could improve the quality of life for older adults uh, outside of the Twin Cities, first and foremost. But they're also willing to support older adults in the metro region. And once they heard our network concept, they were willing to, to fund that concept really as a proof of concept project. So we are doing work, we are developing a network and going about the business of a, a network enterprise as a brand new kind of operation in Minnesota. So that concept became Juniper, had another very long name before, we won't go into that, but it became Juniper and it's this network of local organizations delivering services supported by a hub organization innovations for aging, and I'll just call it IFA for short. And, and then um, we basically gave life to a threefold strategy, market creation, demand for classes, right? Two, availability of services in the market. You have to have demand, you have to have available services. And three, you have to have a way to purchase them. So the third leg of that, uh, of that stool was partnership with new payers who shared our goals to help ensure sustainability of our concept. So we dedicated a team at IFA to step outside the traditional boundaries of a Minnesota AAA role and create a large scale innovation. And, and that's how Juniper came to be. So how does it work? And AAA's uh, subsidiary IFA is the engine that houses the Juniper program. We partner with Minnesota Regional and the Tribal AAA and that first uh, was about developing uh, providers and engaging organizations to, to deliver services. And more recently, it's about a focus on marketing, particularly via local clinics and other healthcare providers and on network ad adequacy. We, wanted, we want everyone to know about Juniper, older adults, their families, other providers and care managers. Now, IFA is the hub organization or management services organization that, um, that develops. And Julie, let's go to the next slide. IFA is the hub organization that uh, supports this network you see on your screen. Sometimes we refer to it as an MSO. And, and we've developed and executed business plans. We provide the technology hub and marketing support. We utilize, utilize a wellness engagement call center and we hold contracts from health plans and governmental entities uh, to pay for the work of Juniper, including to pay for the delivery of services by local organizations. Now, a network is an efficient conduit of resources to community and a champion of evidence-based health and social care. So the network supports regional reach and local capacity, economies of scale, and a single contracting point for partners. IFA performs common back office business functions and eliminates administrative burden for local providers. You can see from the slide that Juniper is an interconnected network. Doesn't it, it looks much cleaner, doesn't it, than the prior slide, which showed a lot of busyness and maybe chaos. But instead here, what you see is a well-organized interconnected network of individuals, organizations, and communities working together to improve health. Now this network, even though it's large, is pretty nimble and can quickly pivot and respond to unexpected scenarios, including the COVID-19 pandemic. And the network can do this all while maintaining standards, including those of fidelity to the programs themselves, quality service delivery, and very important data security. And obviously this is never more critical than the onset of the pandemic and our need to move to virtual class delivery. Now the network serves a large geographic area and cross-sector and public-private partnerships are key. Now we can learn more through a poll and Tom, I think you're going to put up our first poll question, right? So everyone can participate and respond. And um, here we go on the screen. So out of the 87 Minnesota counties, how many counties did Juniper's network of providers hold classes in when the Juniper network began in 2016. So select your option. I see the blue lines. If 
Be sure to focus just on question number one. Um, we might need a little help here. Do we want to uh, poll for both questions one and two? Is that what everyone's getting an option to do right now? That is correct. All right. So question number one and question number two. And if you slide down, the second question in is what was the average age of a Juniper class participant reached at the onset of Juniper? So when we first began, what was the average age? I see that we have a participant who's raised her hand. Tom, are we ready to end our polling? Getting close. It looks like I'm not seeing a lot of new results coming in, so I'm happy to share it. All right, let's go for it. All right, so let's let's look at the answers. Uh, you can see that um, 22 was um, was uh, the res uh, overarching response, and um, and the answer is that. Um, Juniper's network of providers held classes in 36 of the 87 counties. So we're uh, fairly close. And question number two, what was the average age of a Juniper class participant at the onset of Juniper? The answer is 60 to 69 years old. And we have, uh, I think, lots of very smart people in the polling. Excellent, Tom, thank you. So let's go on then to the next slide. So before we go any further, let's take a moment to describe that classes that Juniper offers. Um, we categorize them in three buckets, live well, get fit, and prevent falls. And uh, all focus on learning from leaders and from each other. People report feeling heard and supported, and they take steps. Participants take steps that work for them and for their lives. The first, live well, these are disease self-management classes primarily those developed by Stanford University. These classes are offered in English. They're also offered in other languages and some have a specifically developed cultural curriculum. Now they focus on diabetes, heart di disease, depression, depression, et cetera, and other chronic conditions, all help people address emotional well-being. The Get Fit classes, uh, for example, SAIL, Stay Active and Independent for Life, focus on strength, balance, and general fitness. And our classes to prevent falls help participants set realistic goals for increasing activity and mobility and for changing one's home environment to reduce the risk of falling. Strength building and balance are a strong focus. And people who take the Tai Chi Kwan class, Moving for Better Balance, learn these skills through, um, through Tai Chi forms. Now let's look at our next slide. I love this slide. It really depicts interaction with others, right? Uh, the, the slide with the table setting where people are sharing, they're actively engaged in conversation, making great eye contact. And then the other slide shows movement and kind of happy and joyful movement, so critical to feeling good. Now, I think we've got a couple more polls. So let's take a break from me speaking again and have fun with two more polls to get your perspectives um, on Juniper's reach. Tom, I think we're ready for our next polls. All right, so two more questions. Uh, go ahead, out of the 87 Minnesota counties, how many counties did Juniper's network community-based organization providers hold in-person classes in early 2020? And then question number two, how has the average age of Juniper participants changed since 2016?
Looks like everybody's voting faster. I've got the hang of this now. I think it looks like voting has slowed down, Tom. I think we should go ahead. We've got some folks who just aren't going to vote. All right, so the answer to the first, Juniper providers offered in-person classes located in 77 of the 87 counties. And I think the good news is that today with virtual class delivery, we can serve people no matter where they live in Minnesota. And the second question, average age, has it changed since 2016? the average age has decreased to 50 to 59 year old versus the 60 to 69. Thanks, Tom. So you might ask why has that uh, age range broadened? And it's because we are serving uh, individuals, uh, some who are less than 30 years old. And we've, had a, we've seen an increase, 118% increase in that uh, 30 to 39 year old age range. And it's because caregivers are attending classes with the, an older individual. So we have caregivers and younger individuals attending classes that have a diagnosis of diabetes, prediabetes, and chronic pain. All right, let's look now at my final slide. And I, I want to uh, start my concluding remarks by saying that AAAs rarely work in isolation. Our overarching lens is development and operation in a network. And we've always believed that we can do more together and that collective impact is central to our worldview and our approach. So where will this take, Juniper? What innovations are ahead? Many elements will stay in place. Trusted community partners offering programming, in places where participants are comfortable and learn from peers, environments with gentle direction where self-efficacy can grow and be exercised. We're continuing to identify new funding models for sustainability, moving from grants-based to service-based enterprise. We're, we're focused on greater integration with health systems, um, with health partners and potentially others. We're piloting, for example, a replicable model with a community health worker in clinic to facilitate referrals. And we'll be fully developing ability to successfully bill through a claims process, completing research using our own current network data to create solid return on investment uh, predictions, improving quality of service delivery, ramping up marketing for the Juniper brand, seeking credentialing um, and reviewing utilization and other data to make decisions and grow impact. We'll be maintaining virtual classes and developing hybrids of personal and in-person post pandemic. So we've got one more poll. Should we go to that, Tom? All right. Here's your question. How have evidence-based health promotion program provider types changed from 2016 to current? You have lots of choices there. What do you think? It might be a dead giveaway. Tom, I think we should close the poll. And the answer is really all of the above. Every type of organization represented has uh, increased their 
participation in Juniper. So how can we go forward and help each other? We want to continue to focus on our shared interests and act together to bring services to people who need them, both now and for the long term. What's the most critical work we can do now? It's getting creative about referrals, especially those from healthcare providers. And why is that important? Is because we know that when a provider refers, people are much more likely to participate in a class. Essentia has done some, Essentia Health has done some amazing work where they've used their electronic health record to virtually communicate a class opportunity uh, in the Juniper, um, in the Juniper sphere. And we've seen a large enrollment in classes as a result of that encouragement that comes through uh, Essentia's uh, uh, My Health uh, to one of their patients. Referrals through care coordinators, including those at Blue Cross Blue Shield, have demonstrated that that encouragement makes a big difference as well. Marketing, uh, we can all engage in additional marketing and really be, be uh, very cognizant that Juniper is a systems approach. We're in this together and we want to create sustainable change for people and communities. So by working together to build a big tent and raise a big tent, we can all participate and benefit. So thank you for, uh, for being with us today. Thank you to everyone who's participated so far in the Juniper Network. Um, I want to give you my applause. I learned this earlier, or maybe you learned this last week, that ASL for applause is this. So if you want to do this at any time during the presentation today, that means applause. And I'm sending my applause out to every uh, organization that helped to develop and support Juniper and every organization that's engaged today. And I think we have just a minute or two for a burning question. Thank you. Indeed we do, Don. Hi everyone, I'm Rachel Von Rudin. I'm a Provider Relationship Manager for Juniper and we do have a few minutes for questions and answers from Don Simonson. You're welcome to use the chat feature or if you want to ask your question on video, go ahead and raise your hand using the virtual Zoom tool, of course, and we will find you and unmute you so you can ask your question on camera. I think it would really be just fine if there are no questions because then we'll stay on schedule. And that I think is really the best uh, move right now. So I'll turn it back then to, um, back to uh, you, Sarah, and we'll go forward. Great, thank you so much, Don. It, it's really um, amazing to hear all of the, the wonderful work and, and outcomes that uh, started as the Juniper, Juniper Network of Providers across the state of Minnesota. And it's so encouraging to see the growth over these years. And I think it's just really great to, to highlight that quote again from um, that Don shared, you know, alone we can do so little, but together we can do so much, um, knowing that we are in our individual communities and responding to our, our, our community's needs. And, and just, just look at all of the work that we've done um, over these last years in serving our communities and um, the state of Minnesota with these, with these classes, health promotion and falls prevention classes. So thank you, thank you to all of you. Um, we do have a few minutes to break and take some time to stretch. I know in this virtual space, um, we, you know, it's a lot of screen time, a lot of sitting time, unless you, unless you're standing, that's amazing. Um, so we can take some time to pause now, and then we will come back at 2.45, um, where we will break out into um, discussion groups, and about 10 people or so in those groups, you'll be able to um, reflect on what Don mentioned, um, and that those breakout rooms will be led by a Juniper Provider Relationship Manager um, to help facilitate the conversation. So again, the breakout groups will start at 2.45 and we will close those groups at around 3.15, so a half an hour of, of really good conversations happening with, with our, um, our peers in this space. Um, 
So again, I'm glad we all had time to come together and break out sessions and and that we've had time to really meet and engage with each other um, with a, you know, I think some of the, the groups had that Juniper provider relationship manager to really connect with and, and um, um, learn about uh, their perspectives as well as from everyone else's perspectives. So from what, um, from what I've heard in, in a breakout room that I attended is it goes in alignment with that, that quote, it's just going to stick with me is, you know, alone we can do so little, but together we can do so much. So I'm gonna take my notebook here. I was taking notes. Um, and this came from Ace of Southwest Minnesota. And I, I'm, I'm really happy to share this and I'm, I'm hopeful that it's okay, but um, it's just that, you know, Juniper has brought the county, the seven county area in Southwestern Minnesota, more together as a team themselves is what, is what was said. And they found themselves working together more as a team with their um, community members um, and community organizations in this space. We will be able to come together again in the same groups. We'll zoom back into those same groups after um, our keynote speaker, Mr. Timothy McNeil. So, you know, we, did, we took some time to learn about the broader view of Juniper uh, from Don, the, what we've done in the last few years. And she shared um, some, some of the broader concepts of, you know, um, where Juniper may, may be headed and, and that momentum that we've done into this, um, this space um, in the, in, you know, those, this next phase, I guess, is how maybe you want to say it. And now I'd really like to take that some time to take from this broad space and, and now, well, I'm going to use the term again, zoom in the lens, I guess, <laughs> zoom in a little bit closer and help the picture become more clear and crisp to us all. Um, and really take some time to focus on what Juniper's community-based organizations and, and the partners are doing, what, what we're doing best is delivering services to our community members and our communities and connecting with community organizations with our communities to sustain this work, I think. So as Juniper um, network providers and partners, we know that the classes are led by lay leaders um, and the lay leaders provide educational tools and self-care strategies to help help our, the individuals in the classes um, take charge of their health and well-being. And I think, um, or take charge of their health and well-being and then empowering of health and well-being was something that was said in another breakout room. And I think this really hits on, um, you know, what one of our early physician advisors said is, as you can see on this slide, Juniper helps people become the CEO of their health and well-being. Um, and you know this statement is supported by what class participants have have shared about their experiences, and this is a real um, a really great benefit to be able to, as a statewide network, we we as leaders as as providers we're we're able to do this work because of um, support from the administration for community living, and there are some survey questions that are asked for participants um, for the first session and then last session. And we're able to learn about these experiences um, and, and share these learnings with the administration for community living or national council on aging. And what participants are saying, um, specifically in the live well class, the classes, the participants have really shared positive outcomes. And I know you all have those positive outcome stories as well. Um, but as far as for the information that we have throughout the state, 95% of the class participants say the class have helped them eat healthier for the living well classes. And then 91% say they've worked with their healthcare provider to talk about their chronic condition. So it's bringing this, you know, we're experiencing healthcare health, um, where we may rely on the clinical system, but we're bringing our experiences of health and going into our community settings and talking with our peers and then being able to take what we learn in these groups and talk back um, and work back with our healthcare professionals. So it's really great to see that full loop come in with 91% of the participants being able to say that. And similarly, 94% of the um, individual participants in the falls prevention classes. So like stepping on, matter of balance, um, Tai Chi, moving for better balance, have said that the classes have helped them prevent falls. And that's 94%, um, pr you know, taking, a, taking those tools and learnings in, in those classes and preventing falls, which is, you know, how great would that, would that feel of being able to 
um, have better balance, have better motion, and know that you don't have to be scared of falling. So as Don mentioned, Juniper's network of health promotion and falls prevention classes grew. And I think that's a feedback that I also received in some of the, you know, I heard this a lot in the, the breakout rooms is there's been tremendous growth um, in the number of providers and the type of providers. Um, but we also saw a, a significant growth from year to year of serving um, our communities, serving participants. So the number of class participants grew by 33% from 2018 um, to 2019. And that's really cool just to see um, that growth as well as um, the class completion rate. So knowing that people stay to about two thirds of the, um, the amount of classes available has increased about 37%. Um, so it's really great to see that collectively we've, we've offered all of these um, programs and served um, we continue to increase that momentum and serve uh, individuals in our communities. We know um, in 2020, we planned for to continue this momentum, but our, our network, um, because 2020, we had this solid momentum, we were planning and serving more individuals. But of course, in 2020, um, our plans changed like um, so many other plans have changed because of COVID. So um, some response that we've been able to do during the pandemic is, you know, initially we did have to cancel 155 classes and, you know, some of the providers um, had to respond to their communities in different ways because of the struggles that the pandemic brought to their local communities. Um, you know, the pandemic did present challenges, but it also gave us some opportunities. So I'd like to highlight some of that. Um, you know, quickly, we've been able to quickly convert to online classes. It was it was a quick big shift. It, it felt like turning a big um, a big a big ship in the ocean. But we were able to do that because of the providers that were able to offer these classes in 2020 to um, really give feedback and respond to those uncertainties of our environment. So we we built. Um, or we became a deeper, stronger, and more efficient um, provider network. And, and that is happening because of um, all of you. Um, we've been able to offer virtual telephone classes, providing essential support for people in our communities, and knowing that technology provides us new options, kind of a sil silver lining to this evidence-based space. So because of um, the way to, because we've been able to respond to this, if we go to the next slide, um, we'll see that this ability of our network to respond quickly and efficiently and being able to shift, we've been able to help our partners more efficiently as well. So this is a really great um, opportunity to know that what you've all done, what we've all done, um, it's just a, our, our ability to respond to, you know, if there's pain in this part, we can respond as a, a strong network to respond to that pain, to get that, that pain point for this, for example, this um, system here from this quote from M Health Fairview, that Juniper's swift actions and smooth transitions, we've been able to help them and we're helping each other in this space. Um, so I think now, you know, we've been able to do that and um, with the support from our local communities and our local provider relationship managers. As you can see on this slide, um, the, the local provider relationship managers are the experts in their communities and are alongside with you of, of bringing in the services to what you know your communities need. So as far as for... Um, Moving, you know, let's move to the next slide and, and talk a little bit about how these, the ability to move classes from in-person to remote, and then that was to the telephone or on this platform, how that has um, worked and how maybe that hasn't worked and maybe what we're learning along the way. So we've been successful in this space because it's, it's that we understand our local communities and the needs of our, our older adult members uh, in our communities about the limitations forced by the, the pandemic in this situation. And in 2020, our responsive network came up with new and innovative ways to deliver the evidence-based programs to really meet the need of, of what exists and, and it will continue to increase. So we introduced, like I mentioned, virtual and telephone classes. 
Um, we do know that some of the programs cannot be provided remotely, um, such as stepping on in a matter of balance, just because of the evidence-based practice of in-person um, versus virtual. However, um, we do know that Juniper is focusing on new opportunities to include more diverse provider network um, that's not only successful in this virtual space, but that we feel comfortable in doing this. So being able to, if you are a stepping on provider, identify different um, programs to, be, to offer virtually during this time of um, physical distancing um, and COVID. Um, we also know that in, uh, you know, offering these classes remotely and virtually it doesn't always work for, for our community members. Um, and I, I heard that in some of the breakout rooms too. But um, what we've been able to do to answer these concerns and these difficulties is working with the um, participants one-on-one -on -one or in an introductory session with class leaders and Juniper provider relationship managers to talk through how to use the Zoom platform. Um, just like, um, and it would be that session zero introductory session. And we know that if the participant is still having difficulties, we have support in the Juniper team, like the Wellness Engagement Center, who can then meet one-on-one -on -one with that participant and really um, help the, the participant feel confident and comfortable in this newer space. So let's go to the next slide. Um, oh, I see we've already gone through the slides. Sorry, Julie. <laughs> um, what we can, we'll go back to the previous slide. Um, thanks. Um, we worked together to overcome these challenges. We we were able to get these classes in a virtual remote platform. We've um, for for the false prevention classes for the Living Well series. We've been able to implement these classes by telephone, um, and it's really fun to be able to see the specific feedback of what participants are experiencing, not only in those numbers, um, but that they've been able to, um, like in the, the quote on the last slide here, that um, the participants have found, even in a virtual space, a participant feels that they're able to, you know, stay at home in a safe space and, and be able to engage with peers and, and community members, even though the community members might be, you know, from one person from um, Brainerd or one person from Fargo and another person from Mankato, just really being able to see that connection um, and feel that sense of community and socialize together. So um, with 2020 and, and COVID, it did bring us new opportunities in the mode of delivery. Um, I want to just really quickly highlight some of the new programs that we've been able to bring into this space. Um, so in addition to offering these programs in a different way, we've also been able to respond um, as a Juniper team and network to provide additional services and uh, a new class. And that class was a Social Connect program. And Social Connect is a, a space that provides you know, during COVID, we might just feel um, alone, um, stressed or anxious about the environment. Um, and we've been able to partner really significantly with the Central Minnesota Council on Aging and specifically our provider relationship manager, program developer, Steve Hoover, in developing that social connect class designed for older individuals um, in mind. And this social connect space provides a small group, live video conferencing, or by telephone as well, um, if, if the individual is not comfortable joining by video conference. And participating in a facilitated conversation, um, which starting with gentle seated movement, like Tai Chi moving for better balance movements, or similar evidence-informed um, activities to engage really that whole body. And then have a uh, followed, having that activity followed by uh, time to learn about tips um, to reduce stress and, and help keep the participant on a positive outlook um, when there's so many other uncertainties happening in our, in our um, communities right now with, with COVID. Um, also, um, in addition to Social Connect, there's the Aging Mastery Program. Um, we've been able to implement that and, and launch it on, on yourjuniper.org um, because we've been able to um, 
work closely with the National Council on Aging. And also we've been able to add a team member, Jen Rooney, um, to the Juniper team to help um, expand these, this class, this opportunity to our communities. And I wanna highlight um, Aging Mastery and, and the National Aging Mastery Program in the National Council on Aging has really um, allowed us to be creative in the space of how to get the service to participants. So right now we know there was a, um, you know, a creative way of offering the program a book style club during their Nordic walking club. So that was in the summertime. And there isn't a class that's been happening where the class is located in a facility. So a, an independent living facility. Um, and the, the individual participants are there in the room. But the visitors, the, the speakers um, who come in and, and talk for each one of the 10 core sessions to talk about ways to manage health and maintain economic security and to contribute to society, these speakers are actually um, on video and it's broadcast in that room at the facility. So you could think about that as a hybrid method. So, so that's something that we've been able to, to creatively implement and respond to that specific community need. Well, um, I just want to um, reserve some more time. I know that we're a little bit over. So um, for Tim and, and the keynote, and so I'm just gonna end here and, and close that we, we know while COVID-19 continues and there are just so many uncertainties that Minnesotans may experience and will likely experience an increased feeling of isolation and loneliness and just stress, right? Um, when we're when we don't know what's happening, that, that brings in that, that stress is maybe something that I, I shared with the, the entire group at the onset of this summit. Um, and Juniper's online and telephone health promotion classes really do help individuals stay well, stay connected, and manage stress and anxiety during these uncertain times. So, you know, we've accomplished a lot this year and we'll continue to accomplish a lot and implement new creative ways of delivering these classes to reach the individuals who need who would benefit and will and have been benefiting. And it's really fun to show off, I guess, what we've accomplished this year, um, because as we've been uh, learning in Minnesota through this network of, work, of providers, we've actually been able to um, share our learnings and with, with the uh, uh, national audience invited by the Administration for Community Living to present um, to other, in, other networks throughout the nation. Um, so we presented at multiple national webinars to share what you've all been doing, a successful remote class implementation during COVID. And um, we've played a really important role in aiding the National Council on Aging and, uh, and really the, the and individuals part of that space of evidence-based programming um, to learn and, and, and be successful in their own communities to get these services. So hats off to everyone. And I think that goes into a little bit of, of um, our, next, our next time. I know it's 3.36 and 3.30 Central Standard Time is when Tim McNeil, the keynote speaker, is going to, going to speak. So I think that's an appropriate segue because um, I'd love to now introduce Mr. Timothy McNeil, our keynote speaker. Um, and I think it's an appropriate segue because um, Tim McNeil it has been a really strong um, figure at the National Council on Aging and Administration for Community Living Space. So I'm, I'm going to introduce Tim McNeil, um, and it's just really great to be able to have him join us today. So he, Mr. McNeil is the founder of Freedman's Health, um, a Washington, D.C. healthcare consulting firm specializing in implementation of innovative models of care. Um, he has served customers, including the Department of Human Services, Administration on Aging, Administration for Community Living, um, the National Area Agencies on Aging, and various foundations and national prof nonprofit organizations. And he's been a really prominent figure and lecturer where he has shared stories and tips forming how to form successful networks of community-based organizations to respond to care coordination needs. So knowing that connection between the, the needs of the individual and our class participants and responding to those needs. 
Tim has been the lead technical assistance provider to establish and support integrated networks to deliver new models of care that address medical risk and social determinants of health supporting value-based contracting in 26 states. So please, please help me in welcoming Timothy McNeil. Great, thank you so much. Uh, the, thank you for the, the warm welcome in, and introduction. It's a pleasure to meet and talk with everyone over Zoom. Uh, hopefully one day we'll be able to meet in person again someday soon. Uh, I see that on the horizon. Uh, well, one thing for sure is that uh, this COVID-19 pandemic has really laid bare some challenges in the healthcare delivery system. And I'd like to highlight some of those now. I mean, it's really laid bare the impact of social determinants of health, laid bare the vulnerability of nursing homes substantially with the the rising mortality rate in nursing homes and really laid bare cracks in the nation's long-term care capacity. And so we really need to begin looking at solutions. And I, I truly believe, and others are, are mirroring my belief in that healthcare leaders and the healthcare delivery system may be forever changed by the pandemic. I vividly remember in graduate school when we were studying, I have my master's in public health and we were studying pandemic, endemic, and so forth. It's like, this will never happen again. Um, clearly, I was wrong. Uh, so this was uh, vitally important. So as we begin to go into what may be a long period of escalation and disease spread uh, with rising uh, hospitalizations and cases in the winter months, the increasing mortality rates should really begin having us look at how will we deliver care differently as was highlighted by Sarah and the, the Juniper team, um, the way you delivered your evidence-based programs had to change. And ongoing healthcare providers are really thinking that all of those things are gonna have to change as well. One of the things that is very clear is that a concerted effort to address social determinants of health is gonna be longstanding. And we may have to begin thinking about interventions to address social determinants of health in the same way that we look at medical interventions where they're delivered, there's a payment amount that's tied to that. There's an evaluation to see the impact. And they, we also need to see ways that we're going to improve the long-term care system. And if healthy aging and stabilization of persons in community settings as long as possible, if that is the goal, if that's what we have to move towards, there really isn't a delivery mechanism to achieve that other than the aging and disability network. So the question for the leadership that's on this Zoom call and across the country is, can we rise to the occasion? Because the occasion is now. Can we be the leaders in addressing social determinants of health? I often, I get invited to a lot of meetings, a lot of calls, and I kind of chuckle when I hear about the next greatest app that's going to solve social determinants of health. Um, I haven't seen it yet, and it, it is never going to be the case. It's always going to be where someone with the ability to truly assess a person's need, develop a person-centered plan, target interventions to the need, evaluate the impact of those interventions. That's the way medicine is delivered not to medicalize the social service network, but we are going to deliver services and really have been delivering services in that manner. We just have not been presenting it that way. And um, so many health plans are seeking out solutions. So one, I wanna give an example. Um, so in the DC market, I have the luxury, I live in the DC area, where I, I, I like to stay clinically relevant and clinically in tune with what's happening. And so I'm working with some of the health systems with some of their complex patients that they need to discharge back to community. And recently I was working with a 75 year old who was on a, me a Medicaid waiver, had assistance with her activities of daily living, had diabetes, had complications for her diabetes, requested assistance with how to manage. Sounds like the perfect person for a Juniper class. Well, that person, their aide developed COVID and exposed that person to COVID. And then her neighbor developed COVID who was also receiving services from the same aid. So the DC Health Department said, this person needs to quarantine. And so what does that mean for someone who requires an aid for 
eating, bathing, cooking, shopping. And so I had explained that to the health department and they said, well, she needs to come in for uh, testing. Well, how does she get there? Uh, what's the travel arrangements? How are you gonna accommodate her? And this was just the beginning of the issues that the system has really laid bare that there is complications. The next round of this, how do I vaccinate these people who have all these limitations? The only way this is gonna work is the health system is gonna have to integrate with community-based organizations that really are the tip of the spear to use a military term, that are right at the point of care for those most vulnerable. And these failures in the system have to begin, address, begin being addressed. Uh, so if you look at some of the solutions that health plans are seeking and even health systems, there are buying apps and, and systems such as Unite Us, Aunt Bertha, uh, now, pal. So, and those things have definitely filled a void in the marketplace. Uh, but we've already begun hearing feedback from health plans, from health systems, that that is not the panacea to solve all problems. And so, here to give you another real example, uh, there was a working with a beneficiary, 65 year old male, that was referred from Unite Us to the local area agency on aging for food insecurity. And when we began to really pull back the layers to find out what his issues were, he was unable to get his prescription pain medication because of the pandemic, the closure of his pharmacy, the lack of transportation. And he began to go on withdrawals because he had been on long-term narcotics for chronic pain. He began to supplement and try to address his withdrawals by getting heroin. This is a 65 year old male that was also on oxygen treatment. He, want, he, did, he felt bad and wanted to get off the heroin. So he started getting street methadone. And then it was just a complication of errors. This person was referred to the health department for mental health treatment and substance abuse treatment, but they had never seen a 65 year old on oxygen and chronic disease in a wheelchair and said they didn't know how to treat him. Uh, so again, just, the linkage to the system was, well, we have Unite Us. Unite Us will link us to some community services and this problem will be solved. But when you pull back the layers without intensive case management, there was not a solution. And this person is not unique. These people exist in our communities and they are in every state, in every community. They have very complex needs and it, need, it requires a robust network of agencies that can deliver services. But, um, and, that, and again, not to, um, to uh, look down on Unite Us or these other systems, but they are causing complications because their adoption in the marketplace is occurring without a uniform process that has the community at the table who is the crux, who is the entity that is going to be required to address the true social determinants. So to give you another example of a market that I'm working in where that market, we have multiple health plans that are bought Unite Us. We have the health department and other Medicaid MCOs that are using Aunt Bertha. And they're all trying to feed referrals to the same overtaxed network of community-based organizations. And what is more complex is that in markets where multiple entities are contracting with these systems, every time they're opening up a, a new database, a new table. So I'm supporting an area agency on aging in this particular state. And this one case manager has three different logins for Unite Us. And that's because when the hospital purchased Unite Us, there was one database, one table, one login. When the health plan did, she got another login for another table. Then when the health department purchased Aunt Bertha, she got a login for Aunt Bertha. Then the Medicare Advantage plan got on Bertha. And so now this one case manager is trying to navigate four different platforms with four different logins. I, obviously untenable. Um, as with everyone else, uh, I had to prepare for homeschooling with the pandemic. And I remember very distinctly when I went to get my daughter prepared, they had misspelled our last name. Um, so the, my last name, McNeil, most people with McNeil, McNeil have one L, I have two L's. And so the, our name was misspelled. So our login, our Zoom, everything had our last name misspelled. And I told the principal, 
there's no way I'm going to remember to misspell my name. I cannot keep the, the Netflix and the Hulu password connect, co correct. I just, it's not possible. It's too many passwords. I'm overloaded. Now think about this case manager that's trying to navigate three different logins just for Unite Us. And so then when that system said, well, it'd be great if you would log in and tell us the outcomes when we send you a referral. So please just log back in. It won't take you in, it won't be too much trouble for you to log back into Aunt Bertha and then just document quickly the outcome of the intervention. Yes, it will be. And if we continue to overburden an overburden system, it's gonna collapse. What I like to say is that we cannot save the investors that have invested into these systems by killing the community-based organizations that we're going to depend on to really address the need. Uh, so lastly, when you look at the opportunities to improve the system during the pandemic, we have to begin looking at who was most impacted and who continues to be most impacted. And what gets lost in all the news, and I'm a news junkie, so I am following uh, everything all night. I'm drinking coffee all night long to see what, what is happening next with this pandemic. Um, but what's been lost in some of that data is I have the opportunity, obviously, as a consultant with ACL to also get some of the information from CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And they provided us with a good overview on hospital utilization and cases amongst the Medicare population. And what was overwhelming really took my breath away from a data junkie standpoint is that the the vast majority of people that are admitted to the hospital for COVID that have Medicare fee-for-service were dual eligibles. And amongst that population, really off the chart was end-stage renal disease. And when you take a step back and think about it, it only makes sense. Like end-stage renal disease patients, just like the person I described earlier, they can't self-quarantine. They can't stay in their apartment. They have to get treatment. So they're going to go get treatment and they may be exposed and they are very high risk. And so that population disproportionately was impacted and continues to be impacted. Dual eligibles are disproportionately impacted. So as we look at hospital readmissions, SNF diversion because of the impact on nursing homes. And there's an increased demand for SNF diversion and hospital to home interventions. Those organizations that rise to the occasion to provide those services have to be adept at what are the true needs of dual eligibles? How do, is the intervention that does that need to be different for someone who has end stage renal disease? And obviously, with those populations, we have to be attuned to what are the social determinants of health that are impacting this person that may lead them to worsening complications, like the individual that I described earlier. He didn't get his pharmacy did not have access, he did not have access to it, he couldn't get his prescription. And for others, I'll just go to another pharmacy, but he did not have transportation. He had very limited access and then went into withdrawals because he could not get his, his medication. And what did he do? He started supplementing it with street heroin to treat the withdrawals, a tragedy, but it happening amongst our myths. And again, these are things that are happening and the average clinical program, and I'm a nurse by training, and so, you know, not to fall on nurses, but the average nurse that, that uh, approaches that would not be, oh my goodness, I, I know exactly what to do. I know exactly which social inter interventions, how to deploy them, how to address that need. No, that nurse needs a community-based organization that knows that person, that community, that knows their neighbors, that is able to mobilize a village to address the needs of the person. And that is what's truly gonna be needed in the future state that we move to beyond the pandemic. Because that future state is coming. The light is at the end of the tunnel. We're beginning to see it. And so we're gonna to need to find ways to support more hospital to home transitions. There had been a lot of focus on 30 day readmissions. And now the focus may be on clinical interventions with community-based interventions that can support um, stabilization in community settings for long-term healthy aging in the community. So SNP diversion, 
community stabilization with mobilization of home and community-based services to meet the need, more focus on disease prevention and health promotion and disease self-management. So uh, it's comical that, that I spent a lot of time before the pandemic uh, talking with health systems who said, why should we work with those community diabetes education programs? Because we have this great diabetes education program at the hospital. And your statement about it's too much trouble for people to get here. We got all kind of parking, just have to pay $5 a day for that parking, but they can come in, they can get all the services that they want. And now the pandemic has laid bare, those services were limited and people went without. And that the, those that had robust programs in the community were able to weather the storm to continue to provide seamless access to address their needs. So that future state is going to require this linkage to resources, a, a formal recognition of the role of community-based organizations to address the needs, the true impact of social determinants of health on health outcomes and rising costs. You cannot turn the cost curve if you cannot address food insecurity, housing stability, uh, disease self-management skills, um, ability to address fall risks in the home. If you can't address those things, you can't truly turn the cost curve for populations that have rising risk. And so that the steps to make that a reality is going to need to begin incorporating into the payment model these delivery of social interventions and health promotion in the community. So as the aging network really thinks about how we will emerge from the pandemic, I, I really want us to emerge ready to lead. It is clear that the health systems cannot lead us to a nirvana where everyone has a range of community interventions to keep them healthy at home for as long as possible. But that is what's going to be required for us to turn the cost curve and, uh, to be in lowering costs and improving outcomes. So we, the aging network needs to come to the table ready to lead, ready to lead to address social determinants, ready to lead in addressing healthy aging and delivering evidence-based programs in community settings where they should be to meet the needs of the population, ready to lead to, to implement hospital or home transitions, to document the return on investment for those transitions, to stabilize people in communities and avoid unnecessary nursing home placement, ready to lead on alternative payment models, and most importantly, ready to lead for to achieve improved disease prevention and health promotion activities so that we can have more networks like Juniper that integrate with health plans, with health systems, drive referrals to that great Juniper network that can then deliver on the outcomes and prove the return on investment that we have always known is there. And now everyone else is beginning to realize that our ability to deliver services in community settings by networks such as Juniper is what is going to keep us safe in the future. So I thank you all for this opportunity to present. Thank you, thank you so much, Tim. Um, I can see some applauding happening. Um, and, you know, I'm so happy that you've been able to, to bring in um, your learnings to our, our group here in Minnesota and, and, and beyond Minnesota, actually, some of the, the attendees. We did have some time to, um, some time reserved for questions. We do have some time reserved for question and answers. Um, but I want to be able to get as many questions and, and the answers that you are able to provide, Tim. Um, so we'll go into that now. Again, reminding everyone we can ask questions in the chat by choosing chat in the lower um, control panel, or you can raise your hand and Rachel Van Ruden will um, have you unmuted so you can pose the question directly to Tim. We will likely um, take less time, if maybe not, maybe time at all for breakout rooms to be able to have a really in, um, good question and answer um, session. So thank you.
Again, are there any questions that you may have for Tim after hearing what he's shared? I see a lot of thank you, really informative presentations. COVID can bring about good changes, great information and insights. I see some questions coming in now, Rachel Van Ruden. Thank you, Sarah. So let's go ahead and start with um, Catherine, who asked, how can Network Hubs position virtual delivery of programs as a specialty offering for short-term contracts with health systems or health plans? Yeah, so I think that it's important to, one, make sure that we're organized as a hub. We have a delivery system that enables us to have ease of access for referrals, our ability to then distribute those referrals, deliver on the service and report the outcomes. Too often, if we make it difficult for the provider to send those referrals, uh, it won't be long before they decide not to send referrals. So we wanna make sure that delivery system is intact and we're always providing feedback on the outcome of those referrals. So that is another often a cited challenge that providers have in making referrals to community-based organizations. So that ability to have a hub that can deliver and receive referrals through one central interface and provide the outcomes is key. Thank you, Tim. And a question from Georgia. Our healthcare systems are flooded with work in COVID response. How can we continue to partner and add value given the complex environment? So you're absolutely right. Um, and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services has also noted through multiple listening sessions with hospitals that, just as you said, that they're overloaded. And interesting enough, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services sent out a guide to hospitals that I'll make available to the Juniper team because it's a very good read and it's important to share that with your hospitals. And in that guide, the guide is, is titled discharge planning during the pandemic. So it's a guide that Health and Human Services has developed for hospitals to help them guide their activities during this pandemic. And it specifically lists that those hospitals need, need to link with area agencies on aging, Centers for Independent Living, Asian and Disability Resource Centers as the community resource to address long-term services and support for persons at risk that need to return to the community. So HHS has identified through the No Wrong Door, National No Wrong Door system, that the best route for hospitals to address the challenges faced during the pandemic is to access us and for us to deliver those services. And so the guidance has been put out, that issue has been, the, has been issued to hospitals, and we just need to take advantage of that to say, let's follow the federal guidance that says you should be doing this. How are we gonna operationalize it in our local community? Thank you, Tim. And Linda asked, what is being proposed by our government to clean up the programs to be able to connect to vulnerable individuals with the healthcare system? Yes, so that is an ongoing discussion. We do understand that some of the challenges with the health system connecting with community-based organizations has been IT. And that's why there's been this proliferation of IT systems that then link to community-based organizations. But we need to have more robust systems that actually are built out to support the community-based organizations in that delivery that really takes our needs into account, that has a clean custom interface that allows us to capture the data, that does not duplicate our efforts, that can have ease of access on our end. Those are things that the, that the Administration for Community Living is heavily focused on, that we've organized a work group of all the major health plans to look at solutions to address this. We've begun highlighting how these issues are negatively impacting the delivery of services. And we have organizations and it's all the major health plans that are now ready to move to, we now really understand this is an issue and we wanna begin finding solutions by pilot testing this in some select markets to find what are the range of possibilities that we should make as permanent policy from the 
government side as well as from private payer side to say these things need to be in place. Thank you. And a question from Jennifer about rural communities. What strategies or opportunities do you see to increase access for individuals who are living in rural communities? Yes, so I have, I have the great luxury of being a consultant for ACL. So I used to have to travel all the time and now I travel on Zoom. And so I'm able to see what is happening across the country. And I have had the great opportunity to talk to multiple rural communities and their hospital leaders. And we're finding significant challenges there with things like remote monitoring, telehealth adoption, and the hospitals needing to leverage those tools in order to free up their very precious limited bed space. And so in some of those settings, including Native Americans, so I had a call with the hospital in, uh, in Arizona and one of their big challenges was how can we serve the Navajo Nation when their members are admitted and now I don't have access to them? And so they wanted to partner with community-based organization and the Navajo Nation to deploy remote, remote monitoring technology to support those persons to remain in the community. So that theme is ongoing, but the challenge that the hospital has been saying over and over again in my meetings is that even if I have the tools, if I have the technology, I don't have the bandwidth to support the end user. I need someone that can work with that person after they get home, that can talk them through, this is how you use the tablet, this is how you use the device. And if you have problems, this is what you can do. And then some of the hospitals said, they, they even when they can get the person to adopt it, they get on a telehealth call and say, now, how do I get food and how do I get my medicine? And the nurses say, I have no idea how to help you with that. So that's again where we come into play. But we need to step up and say, this, this is our lane. This is what we do. This is our expertise. And if we come together, this is how we can solve those problems. Right now, I hear hospitals really working in the dark trying to figure this out because they have not linked with the community. But in reality, sometimes we as a community haven't come to them and said, this is what we do, this is what we do well. And this is the federal guidance that says you should be doing this and this is how we can work together. Thank you. And thinking about groups of people that do things exceptionally well, do you see in, in the country organizations using community health workers or faith community nurses in particular as a bridge to from health care services to social services? I'm kind of combining two questions that came to the chat. Yes, we are seeing more and more where there are organizations that are tapping into the training and expertise of community health workers to augment their workforce to expand their service delivery model. And we've seen that work in multiple uh, markets. Some of the markets where they've deployed social isolation and depression interventions, and then began because of the overwhelming demand, they began training community health workers on the intervention and then use those community health workers to augment the workforce delivery. And that became a nice uh, collection where you have a community health worker that's in tune to their community, that's from the community, that knows the challenges facing that person, then can be employed to deliver services to people in their local community, and it extends the reach of the community-based organization there, where they're able to serve more people. And we have examples where health plans are buying larger amounts of those services once they feel confident that the delivery system is there and that delivery system being augmented by a community health worker workforce. Thank you. And a question specifically about MSHOs or dual eligible individuals. Generally, they have robust care coordination or they have a care coordinator that they work with already. How do you see hubs partnering with those care coordinators to serve dual eligibles? So, so that is a, that's an excellent question. And one thing that 
if I provide this CMS data, again, it's a, it's a rich set of data. When they look at the universe of dual eligibles, and I'll make sure the Juniper team gets this overview of dual eligibles across the country. It's uh, many people think that 100% of dual eligibles are in a special needs plan or 100% of dual eligibles receive long-term services and supports. But the reality is only 49% of dual eligibles receive long-term service support. 51% do not. And that 51% do not have a case manager that are not receiving supports are one heart attack. They're one stroke. They're one COVID infection from needing those services. And when they then get admitted, those services are not in place. And therein lies the challenge. Someone needs to mobilize that team that can get those services in place. You know, the other group that from the hospital perspective, that they, some of those case managers stay awake at night and tell me about some of the horror stories that they run into. And that is those populations of persons that are just marginally above the income for dual eligible status. So they have Medicare today, they have some supplement, and that person is one stroke, one heart attack away from spin down. And where are people going to do spin down? I don't think people are jumping up and down and saying, put me in that nursing home so I can spin down to Medicaid. They're going to need to spin down in the community. Who's going to help them navigate the spin down process? The hospital discharge planners? That is not, that it, it's, it's not possible. So again, there's another population that's in need that we as an agent and disability network are the foregone leaders in how to best help that person. But we need to rise to the occasion and express that we're here and ready to serve those people. Thank you, Tim. And I'm not seeing any additional questions in the chat at this time or hands raised. So I'll just pause a moment to see if anyone's actively typing. It's always hard to tell with Zoom because it takes a little bit longer to get that question through. I think, um, not to try and step in here, but I could raise my hand, but I can also just take myself off of mute. <laughs> um, Tim, I have a question for you. I see a lot of comments coming in, you know, very, um, very great information, wonderful information, and how there are some, you know, we are a network of community-based organizations offering evidence-based programs, um, you know, to our communities. There are other opportunities or other um, services in, in each of our communities. I see that's mentioned by Bridget, um, the No Wrong Door program happening in Minnesota, for example, and using hub models, for example, right? Um, but I'm wondering, you know, how do you see this network of this audience of community-based organizations in this Juniper network space? Um, is this, could this be, you know, we're offering evidence-based programs, right? And responding to the needs of our communities in that space, chronic conditions, falls prevention, you know, social isolation, this COVID space. How do you see this as maybe a lift off, lifting off point um, for this type of network to respond to those other needs that you've highlighted for, during this conversation? I think this is an excellent time because you, what you have what many communities like. You have a cohesive network. You have been working together for some time. You have a delivery system. You have a unified way of capturing data, reporting outcomes, receiving referrals. There are many communities that would die for that type of operation that you already have in place. It's been singularly focused on evidence-based programs. I think this is a great opportunity to take an inventory what is our capability to deliver services over and beyond evidence-based program? And if we begin to approach health payers, health systems, providers that are overtaxed and find, trying to find solutions, can we list out what those services are? How we'll mobilize those services? 
how we will receive referrals and what, frankly, how will we price those services for the marketplace? One example, I have some uh, markets where they have begun mobilizing in a similar manner where they didn't have a delivery system established for the full range of capabilities that they have, uh, but they, that they can deliver as a network. But now that this opportunity is here, they were able to leverage CARES Act dollars that they had. They pieced together their CARES Act dollars and then went to the health plans and health systems in their community and said, we have this opportunity with our CARES Act funding to mobilize and address the need. We wanna spend those dollars with your patients, with your members. However, the caveat has to be that we agree going in, that we're gonna track the outcomes, we're gonna document the return on investment. And if we then can, can prove the return on investment, then we want to then negotiate with you for a payment rate that makes this sustainable long-term beyond the pandemic. And so now they're in discussions and frankly, we had a positive response from the health plan. Yes, we can leverage your CARES Act dollars. We have a need. Let's discuss how we'll do referrals and let's discuss how we will track the outcomes. And if you can prove there's a return on investment with our members, we would have no problem incorporating that into a payment model that extends beyond the CARES Act dollars. So that's another potential way that some communities are mobilizing to address the need and thinking broadly around Yes, we can do evidence-based programs, but we could also do these other things. That particular community I'm describing, uh, their focus was uh, for their next service was going to be on social isolation, depression, and uh, hospitals and home transitions with a focus on SNF diversion. And just for example, a hospital to home or SNF diversion transition, for those of you that participated in 30-day transitions, it usually takes a longer period of time. So this is usually something that extends beyond 30 days. Many communities are finding it takes up to 90 days for a uh, true SNP diversion, but the return on investment for SNP diversion activities is quite high. Thank you so much, Tim. I'm wondering if there may be any other um, questions just maybe late to the to the game. Um, I see a lot of just really just thankful for this information, Tim, and, and taking your time to speak with us today. Um, I see now a question coming in, you know, Tim, can you clarify that diversion that you that you referenced? Yes, and I think there's another question about SNF. Uh, yep. So SNF, when I speak about SNF, uh, SNF is a skilled nursing facility. And so a SNF diversion would be a person is hospitalized for COVID or an un, unrelated to COVID. The hospital is experiencing a surge and they need to get that person out as fast as possible. The nursing homes that used to be the pipeline for post-acute care or care after someone leaves an acute care hospital, but because of the pandemic, that post-acute care delivery system has been disrupted and more people wanna go into the community to avoid the high mortality rate and risk of mortality in a nursing home. And quite frankly, the nursing homes, some nursing homes are just absolutely overwhelmed with just with their own issues, trying to prevent COVID outbreaks in their nursing facility. So a skilled nursing facility or a SNF diversion would then coordinate with a hospital to facilitate a transition of that person leaving the hospital setting and going into the community, diverting that person that would have gone to a skilled nursing facility if they met nursing facility or nursing home level of care. And, and that is, there's great demand for SNF diversion activities now. There's great demand for organizations that have the skill set to support people in the community. And with SNF diversion, sometimes people ask me, well, is that only focused on people who were admitted to the hospital from a nursing home? No, quite frankly, there's a number of people that are being admitted to the hospital would have gone to a short-term skilled nursing facility stay after they left the hospital, but now need to go to the community. Our agencies could mobilize and be the bridge 
to get those persons into the community where they would be much, much safer than they would ever going into a skilled nurse facility in the height of a pandemic with these rising rates. But hospitals need a delivery mechanism to implement SNP diversion activities. Our network is most adept at doing those types of activities. That's really, really great to hear that um, this network um, is well situated. Um, I think, you know, I, I'd love to, to share a comment that came in um, from Mary Jo. So I'll read it. Today, because of what I just learned, I told the daughter of my downstairs neighbor who had been bouncing in and out of the ER that the neighbor probably has a care coordinator. The daughter had no idea um, and the neighbor has memory deficits. Thank you. So it's just really great to be able to come together as this network of community-based organizations. Yes, it's in that evidence-based health promotion program space, which we know is concentrated on chronic disease self-management, falls prevention. But I think what we're learning is that it is, it's providing that support of so much more um, to that individual participant. Um, because we're learning, right? We're learning from each other. We're learning from our, our community members to help navigate in, in a space um, for our own health and well-being. Great. Okay, well, thank you again, um, Tim. And I know we had some time reserved for breakout sessions, um, but I, I think that we, we really benefited from a strong and really um, robust question and answer um, session. So thank you for, for staying a little bit um, more engaged in that space, Tim. I, I hope you weren't just banking on those um, breakout discussions. <laughs> <laughs> I know you weren't. But yeah, you've been providing a lot of helpful information and thank you so much for being able to share those additional resources with our network of providers. We'll be sure to share that with with our in individuals who've registered for this event and, and all of our, 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 uh, our partners here. And I think what you've highlighted, Tim, is, you know, I'm just going to continue that, that quote of, you know, alone we can do, we can do so little, I think is that direct quote, alone we can do little, but together we can do so much more. And I think that is really echoed in the, the space that we've heard um, and the feedback of how our community-based organizations can come together and, and really support each other, learn from each other, and serve our, our communities together through this, I think it, um, you can call it a Juniper Net Hub or, you know, a Juniper Network or Juniper Hub. Great. Great. All right. So I know it's, it's about 4, um, 420 and we we are reserving this time of the summit until 4 30. Um, but I want to you know take time to think about have you think about the 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 questions that I posed earlier today of you know how can we come together as a, a network of community-based organizations yes offering evidence-based programming but how can we you know help um, the participants or instill that empowerment in our participants with making decisions and being their their own leaders in their health and well-being, their own, their own CEOs for their health and well-being. So identifying the tools, um, identifying the tools both for the patient and provider level, um, knowing that as a provider, a, a um, social worker at a health system a, to, a tool is great, but if you have to use the tool in four different logins, that's not very, that doesn't feel very great, right? It gets more cumbersome. Um, and really not just having that, that referral come through, um, but really connecting that patient, that warm handoff with um, what was described as maybe community health worker hubs or um, that integration with a, a clinical setting into a, a network of community-based organizations like Juniper. Um, to get that um, patient into these um, evidence-based programming, um, health promotion and falls prevention programming. So really creating connections with each other, I think um, is, is very important and, and creating connections with the clinical care system to provide simple and really 
warm handoffs as simple as possible to, to help get through this maze of, of, of even uncertainty of what we're experiencing. Um, and we know that we're all experiencing um, difficulties and, and challenges and opportunities at the same time. So let's turn to each other in this space as, per, as clinical providers, as community-based organizations, as payers, and, and really take the opportunity to work together and, and succeed, succeed together. So with this information shared today, we've identified some gaps and some maybe some missed opportunities between um, melding of, of this space between um, of clinical care and, and community um, social um, supportive services for our older individuals in Minnesota and um, really identifying the ability to partner together to fill those gaps is, is going to be um, discussed more tomorrow during day two of the Juniper Summit. Um, we'll be able to share with you the, um, some new opportunities, some new partnerships that Juniper has with um, a, a state agency in, in the space of, of a project for clinical care integration and um, the ability to help um, class participants and clinical patients feel confident um, where we can mobilize together to empower that patient level and that um, clinical care provider level and empower everyone really. So as far as for um, uh, identifying those creative solutions and, and what you've heard today and, and maybe this has gotten some um, wheels turning in your own mind. It'll be um, really wonderful. It'll be really wonderful to continue this momentum and energy in our day two of the of the summit. Um, so I can go into that a little bit on on November eighteenth, tomorrow Wednesday. Our summit will continue. Um, so take time to sleep on on what you've heard today and bring it to um, bring that really positive um, energy and this momentum as a, a strong network of community-based organizations um, throughout Minnesota. Bring that to tomorrow's event, please, um, so we can continue having all of these um, discussions and um, learning opportunities with each other. It does start at 10 a.m. and we'll end at 12, and we'll be able to um, hear from um, a panel discussion, and I'll just um, share who will be included in that panel discussion. We'll send a, a reminder event as well to your to your email. But as far as for the panel of discussion for tomorrow, we'll have a diabetes prevention program class participant join that panel, a living well with chronic pain master trainer and class leader from Amherst um, H. Wilder Foundation. We'll be able to, um, um, we'll, we're including David Stibby, the Juniper Provider Relationship Experience Manager, and the individual um, leading the effort for that non-narcotic pain intervention um, project with the Minnesota Department of Health funds. And then Teresa Ambrose, the Minnesota Department of Health Diabetes and Health Behavior Unit Manager, to talk a little bit more about the diabetes prevention program space. We'll also be able to hear from Mark Cullen, the um, Vice President of Strategy and Operations with Innovations for Aging. And he'll help us learn a little bit more about how this Juniper um, network of you all, evidence-based um, evidence health promotion program, community-based organization providers, how um, this is a, a point of, of um, where we can take this momentum, what we've learned today and the needs, and how we can um, work together, continue to work together in the space of responding to other needs for our, our participants like transportation, uh, meals, et cetera, and, and what that may, might look like um, for um, the future. All right, I did see a question come in. Thank you for that. Will a recording of tomorrow's summit be available? And thank you for the reminder. These, um, um, this event is, is recorded and we'll be sharing that with everyone who has registered. Um, so you can take, you can expect that to come in um, uh, both today and tomorrow's event. Um, so you can continue the learning in that way. I know you might have some questions now um, in between now and tomorrow or hopefully after tomorrow um, because we've just hopefully um, 
made some, again, those wheels turn. And if you have those questions, we invite you to bring them to our, our Juniper team. And Julie, if you go to the next slide, I believe, um, here's some contact information if you do have those questions coming in. Um, we heard from Don Simonson, our, our um, the president of Innovations for Aging earlier today, um, Mark Cullen, the vice president of strategy operations and other individuals supporting this, this work. Um, but you can contact us at the information seen on this screen. We're always um, available to, sp to speak during, um, to speak with you, we're always um, welcoming conversations. So if you contact us at the, the toll-free number there, you will, um, you will reach a wellness engagement specialist and they'll help um, talk through some of those questions and find the best person to connect you with, if not them. Okay, well, thank you so much again for joining. It's been really fun to have this day with you all and I look forward to seeing um, you all, and if not tomorrow, um, we'll see you in, the, in a recording, in a, a recorded space. So thank you and see you tomorrow. Have a great evening.